In this image, you are looking at adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. ATP is an energy transferring nucleotide that exists in all of our cells. Structurally, it is made up of adenosine, which is a combination of adenine and ribose. And then it has three phosphate groups. Very importantly, these phosphate groups are attached to one another through what are known as high energy bonds. What happens to ATP within our cells is the high energy bond between the second and third phosphate group is broken. And what this creates is what's known as adenosine diphosphate or ADP. You can see it is now made up of adenosine and two phosphate groups. The third phosphate group has been split off and now is referred to as inorganic phosphate. Additionally, what is created in this reaction is a hydrogen ion. What's most important about breaking ATP down into ADP is that breaking the high energy bond releases energy into the cell. And this energy can be used for mechanical work. An example of mechanical work is within muscle fibers. Inside of muscle fibers, there are what are known as myosin proteins. When ATP is broken down to ADP and energy is released, these myosin proteins can harness that energy in order to perform mechanical work, which is what allows muscle fibers to contract. Since ATP is necessary in order for muscle fibers to contract, this means that any time there is an increase in the force of contraction and or the frequency of contraction, the muscle fiber is going to consume more ATP. An increase in ATP consumption is the same thing as saying an increase in ATP demand. What the muscle fiber must do is start making more ATP in order to meet the ATP demand of the fiber. If it doesn't do this and the muscle fiber continues to consume more ATP than it is creating, then it is possible that the muscle fiber could consume all of the ATP inside of it, which could result in cell death. Muscle fibers have many different metabolic systems they can use for creating ATP. They can break glucose down through a process known as glycolysis. They can break fatty acids down through a process known as beta oxidation. But the specific system we're going to take a look at right now is what's known as the phosphagen or ATP PC system. As was said previously, the phosphagen system is one of a variety of metabolic systems within muscle fibers that serves the purpose of creating ATP. The system consists of stored ATP and stored phosphocreatine. So when, how, and why would the phosphagen system be utilized by muscle fibers? It is typically utilized when the ATP demand within the muscle fibers is very high and often immediate. An example of when muscle fibers have very high and immediate ATP demands is during a sprint. What happens during a sprint is the person goes from a resting circumstance to all of the sudden asking their muscle fibers to contract as forcefully and as frequently as possible. What this means is the demand for ATP within their muscle fibers rises dramatically out of nowhere. So as soon as the sprint starts, there is a dramatic and immediate increase in the ATP consumption or demand within the muscle fibers. And there is no metabolic system within these fibers that can turn on quickly enough or produce enough ATP in order to meet this ATP demand. So what the muscle fibers will start to do is consume the ATP that already exists within them. And what that means is if you look inside of these muscle fibers, there will be a decrease in ATP within these muscle fibers. And if there's a decrease in ATP within these fibers because ATP is being consumed, then there must be an increase in the amount of ADP, inorganic phosphate, and hydrogen ions within these fibers. As ADP continues to rise inside of the muscle fibers, 
it will go over to an enzyme known as creatine kinase within these fibers, and it will activate this enzyme. So as ADP rises inside of the fibers and goes over to creatine kinase enzymes within the fibers and activates them, these now activated creatine kinase enzymes will go over to phosphocreatine and a different ADP molecule that is not bound to creatine kinase, and it will latch on to these two molecules. Then a chemical reaction will occur where the phosphate group within phosphocreatine is removed, and that phosphate group will then be donated to ADP. And as the phosphate group is donated to ADP, that resynthesizes ATP. Since phosphocreatine has now lost its phosphate group, it will now just be creatine. The process of creatine kinase removing the phosphate group from phosphocreatine and donating it to ADP to resynthesize ATP is collectively known as the phosphagen or ATP PC system. And as you can now see, it is a system for creating ATP. And hopefully you can also see that what gets the system going is a rise in ADP inside of the fibers. If there's a rise in ADP inside of the fibers, that must mean that more ATP needs to be made. So the rise in ADP activates the phosphagen system by activating the enzyme creatine kinase. The reason that the muscle fibers utilize the phosphagen system during something like a sprint is because the phosphagen system is uniquely equipped to be able to meet incredibly high ATP demands. It is the only metabolic system that can resynthesize ATP in only one step. And since it can resynthesize ATP in only one single step, that means that it can resynthesize ATP at a rapid rate. And during a sprint where the ATP demand is incredibly high and immediate, the muscle fibers need to resynthesize ATP rapidly, which is exactly what the phosphagen system can do. The problem with the phosphagen system is that muscle fibers don't store a lot of phosphocreatine. There's only enough phosphocreatine within muscle fibers for them to be able to run the phosphagen system at a maximal rate for about four to eight seconds. And after that time is up, there is no phosphocreatine remaining, and the phosphagen system can no longer operate. To demonstrate the issue with the phosphagen system, we can look at a 100-meter dash. Elite male sprinters can finish a 100-meter dash in around 10 seconds. What you will always notice if you look right around the 80-meter mark is that velocity will begin to fall off. That means that all the sprinters actually begin to slow down at the end of the race. This same phenomena is true for all sprinters. Elite male or female or average sprinter, everybody slows down at the end of a 100 meter dash. But looking at a 100 meter dash that only lasts 10 seconds is especially easy because 80 meters into the race, we can be certain that we're right around the eight second mark or a little beyond. And at this point, we know that within the muscle fibers, the phosphagen system has to be depleted. There's only enough phosphocreatine within the muscle fibers to last between four and eight seconds, which means it must be gone at this point. Despite the fact that the phosphagen system is depleted at this point, the ATP demand within the muscle fibers stays exactly the same, which is incredibly high. If the phosphagen system is depleted, then the system that can resynthesize ATP at the fastest rate is gone. What this means is the supply of ATP to the muscle fibers is surely diminished. And if the demand of ATP from the muscle fibers is higher than the supply, then the muscle fiber will continue to break down more ATP than it is making. And what will happen is ADP, inorganic phosphate, and hydrogen ions will begin to accumulate within the muscle fibers.
So during a sprint, once the phosphagen system is depleted, the demand for ATP within the muscle fibers will be higher than the supply of ATP. This will cause ADP, inorganic phosphate, and hydrogen ions to accumulate inside of the muscle fibers. And lots of evidence points to one or a combination of these contributing to muscle fiber fatigue. So ADP, inorganic phosphate, and hydrogen ions accumulating within the muscle fibers may all contribute to muscle fiber fatigue in different ways. Regardless, this fatigue would account for why velocity decreases towards the end of the race. And from a physiological standpoint, you would want fatigue to happen when ATP demand is chronically higher than ATP supply. Because if that were to continue on for too long, the muscle fiber could potentially deplete all of the ATP within it, which would be very dangerous. Fatigue will decrease ATP demand so that supply can meet the demand, which will protect the muscle fibers. The idea behind creatine supplementation is to take creatine in the form of a powder about 30 minutes before exercising. This should increase the amount of creatine within the bloodstream, resulting in more creatine going into muscle fibers. The muscle fibers then may take some of that extra creatine and turn it into phosphocreatine. You can see to turn creatine into phosphocreatine actually involves the breakdown of ATP. The phosphate group actually comes from ATP. So this is an energy consuming process and that is why it should be done before exercise. Regardless, if done correctly, this theoretically should increase the amount of phosphocreatine within muscle fibers compared to what it normally would be. If the person performing the 100 meter dash that we have been talking about were to take creatine before performing the same 100 meter dash again, then they should technically have more phosphocreatine within their muscle fibers and the phosphagen system should last longer. This means the phosphagen system would become depleted at a later point in time. So the phosphagen system would no longer be depleted at 80 meters. And the graph should look something more like this. What's happened is the phosphagen system, the system that can synthesize ATP at the fastest rate, lasted longer during this sprint. And what that did was delayed the onset of fatigue because ATP demand could be met for a longer period of time. That would cause velocity to either continue to increase or plateau for longer compared to the first race. So we wouldn't see velocity drop off until after 80 meters. This same concept applies to weightlifting. If the phosphagen system lasts longer due to more phosphocreatine being in the muscle fibers, that should delay the onset of fatigue and perhaps allow someone to get six reps rather than five reps. Most scientific literature points to the fact that creatine supplementation does work, but its effects are minimal. As an example, somebody that's lifting weights may be able to get an extra rep during the first couple sets of their workout. But that would be about it. If somebody were performing a 100 meter dash, it may help them improve their 100 meter dash time by a tenth of a second. But especially with sprinting, creatine can cause people to gain water weight, which can in fact negatively influence sprinting time. So sprinters have to be somewhat careful with creatine supplementation. Taken as a whole, creatine supplementation probably does work to a small degree, but it is very far from a magic bullet.